We gather together as the worldwide people of God. Where in the world shall we serve our God? How in the world shall we serve our God? Why in the world shall we serve our God? Let us now worship God. Thank you for that great singing of that beautiful hymn. This time we pause in our service to acknowledge our need for 
God's grace in our lives to help us to do better this week. I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. None of us is perfect, and we made mistakes. We did things we should not have done, and we left undone those things we should have. And so let us ask for God's forgiveness, both in unison together, this printed prayer before you, and then pausing for a moment of silent and personal prayer. Let us pray together. Almighty God, Mother of mercy, Father of grace, you have called us to one table, but we have pursued our own course. You have promised the abundance of all creation, but in our greed much of the world goes without. You have promised us the bread of life itself, but in our pride much of the world goes hungry. You have promised us the waters of justice, but in our discord much of the world goes thirsty. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us again. Transform us at this table and for this table, and send us from this table as servants of your righteousness by the power of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Children, come make your way to the steps and turn and greet your neighbor this morning on this chilly October. And, uh, prayer time together. But uh, Katie just reminded me on the way out that the children's lesson today is on manna, that bread of life that came from heaven that they collected every day out when they were out in the wilderness, when the children of Israel were uh, out in the wilderness after they left Egypt. So that's a you know, I love it when a plan comes together, right? <laughs> All right. Well, I just wanted to share a few announcements, things happening in the life of our church family, and then we will go to prayer together. Now, where are those notes? Oh, here they are. Just a second. So, of course, I mentioned the walk to end hunger. There's a table out there in the narthex. If you'd please sign up. October 16th in the afternoon, 2 p.m. A nice tradition we've kept up even through COVID and so on was something we could do in both 20 and 21, and we'll do it again together here this month. So sign up and walk with us, and the Social Justice Committee will help sponsor you. Uh, so you uh, don't even have to go around and, and, and look for sponsors. And donations are accepted as well to help feed the hungry in our community. The directory we've been talking about a long time, we're ready to be done talking about it and go to print with it. So a couple more Sundays today and next Sunday. Last Sunday is a drop by a table, Grace will be there, and Anne can be there to take your photo. If you don't have a new fo family photo, you can look at some of those are like from 10 years ago, and uh, the ch kids are all grown up, so <laughs> grown ups look the same, right? But the children uh, grow up. So if you could drop by that directory, make sure you have your latest contact information and get your picture taken, or send one in. You can always do that, of course. Ministry Fair, we'll leave that out for one more Sunday, just... Uh, Walk around that table and look for ways that you can sign up and share your many gifts as we get uh, ministries up and going again this fall here at our church. And of course, today is the Peace and Global Witness offering. You've seen inserts in your bulletin supporting peacemaking efforts of our denomination around the world. And we keep 40% of that offering here in our congregation for our own peacemaking efforts. I believe this, those are the things I wanted to share with you as we go to a time of prayer together. I want to just uh, share, of course, we, on our hearts and minds are the people of Florida, the people of Puerto Rico, uh, now South Carolina and other states along the southeast coast where these storms have impacted them so severely. Uh, the loss of life in Florida is staggering. Uh, so we thank God for the Presbyterian disaster assistance and encourage you once again, and I'm sure our session will meet this week. I'm sure we will make a donation to the Presbyterian disaster assistance on behalf of the church. But if you want to make your own, uh, just go to the PCUSA.org website, and then there's a link to uh, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. 
I wanted to share with you that uh, Rulof, uh, our friend from the Netherlands, is this is his last Sunday with us today. And so, Rulof, we have enjoyed your company and you enjoyed your uh, uh, energy and your love for God. And uh, thank you that you are here these months. He worked at the La Tulipe Bakery here in town uh, over the last year or two, and but now needs to go back to the Netherlands. So make sure you greet Rulof on your way. In fact, let's why don't you stand and we'll just say th thank you for... <laughs> and of course, Wayne and Neville were able to speak to him in a little Dutch uh, to make him feel even more at home. So we'll miss you. Stay in touch, Rulof. I want to mention to you that I saw our friend Bob James, a 97-year-old member of our church. I saw him on Friday, and he is in really good health for someone of his age and sends his greetings. And then we have real exciting news here. There's a rose here on the table. Uh, Rob and Lindsay Wildhack were here last Sunday. And, uh, of course, Lindsay is daughter of Rob, or John and Lisa Lucas. And uh, they have little Hadley, of course, was baptized during COVID. Uh, and uh, we did that video. Well, uh, Lindsay was here last week. She said, I'm going to have a baby in the next week or two. And sure enough, Thursday night, uh, little um, Willa May arrived. So congratulations to the Lucas family and the Wildhack family. And we look forward to another baptism in our church family. Be sure you take this rose home uh, to Lindsay today. That would be great. Are there any joys or concerns you would like to share at this time? Yes, Nelva. I'm not sure if anyone has the microphone, so go ahead and speak up. Yes. How do you say that? Tosis. Tosis Ruloff. Beautiful. Thank you, Nelva. The communion of saints. Thank you so much. That's very nice. Well, let us go to prayer together and we'll share the Lord's Prayer as we come to the table again a little later in our service. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather on this World Communion Sunday, mindful that we are a part of your worldwide family. On this day, we can imagine our brothers and sisters in Christ gathered in grand cathedrals and country churches and even under the shade of a tree. And we are part of this worldwide Christian family, but we are also part of a much bigger, broader, and more inclusive family, the human family. And help us respect all your children for how they see you and worship you. We pray this day for those in our American family who are suffering after the terrible storms. We pray for the people of Puerto Rico, Florida, South Carolina, and other states where there has been loss of life and widespread destruction. We thank you for the work of Presbyterian Disaster Assistance and others who commit themselves to helping those in need. It's at times like this that we realize we are truly part of one family. As a church family, we have much to be thankful for. We celebrate the safe arrival of Willa May Wildhack and pray your blessing upon her, her big sister Hadley, and mom Lindsay and dad Rob. May we be faithful to our call to help raise all our children, your children, in the faith. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This time we welcome back uh, Ian and Anne from their time overseas in the UK, and he'll read for us two psalms uh, together today. morning. Our Old Testament reading today is Psalm 133 and Psalm 134, and I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon 
were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Psalm 134. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is the maker of heaven and earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Love that communion hymn, and we save it for the fall every year. (laughs) It's so appropriate, and uh, even more so this year on World Communion Sunday. Our New Testament reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4, the first six verses, continuing that theme of unity. Therefore, my... Whoops, that's the Philippians. That's one back here. Ephesians, there we go. Didn't look right. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 6. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today is, as we've said, World Communion Sunday. It's a special Sunday on the calendar in many Christian denominations, and it's always celebrated on the first Sunday in October, and has been since the 1930s, and then more widely after the National Council of Churches adopted it after World War II. I'm proud to say it started in a Presbyterian church, like all these good traditions. (laughs) It started in Pittsburgh in 1930, the year that the pastor of the famous Shady Side Presbyterian Church was moderator of the General Assembly of the United Presbyterian Church. His vision was that there would be one Sunday where we could focus on our unity rather than our divisions, even within the Christian family, thousands of denominations and so many divisions. Let's focus on our unity. Well, good thing we don't need that anymore, right? We've healed all our divisions in our society, right? (laughs) Well, actually, we could use anything that emphasizes unity now more than ever. Of course, World Communion focuses on our unity as Christians, which is important, of course. But as one begins to dwell on the importance of unity, one sees the need to draw the circle wider and wider until it includes all of humanity. One of the most powerful symbols of unity is family. We talk about our Presbyterian family, our Christian family, and the family of God, which is by definition everyone. Today is the first Sunday in our October theme of the church as family. So starting next week, we'll work our way through, if you will, the life cycle of a family as we focus first on marriage and other adult committed relationships, families with young children, families with older youth, and then families with older adults. And we'll have fun and educational activities throughout the month to deepen our ties that bind us together as family in this place. But today our focus is on the worldwide family of God. We start with the lens wide open in wide angle before focusing on those other aspects of family life. It's an appropriate theme for our times and it sets a good foundation for our discussion of family, doesn't it? Because we don't want to draw a boundary around our family to keep others out, do we? We want to strengthen our family bonds even as we, have our open, even as we open our eyes and our hearts to the people who are part of the larger Christian, larger national, and even larger human family. Our scriptures for today emphasize unity in the family of God. 
The Psalms, and I'm actually glad you read the NIV today. We usually use the new RSV, but there were things about the NIV that you like that I liked. Thank you, Ian. The Psalms provide some powerful ancient imagery, and then the New Testament offers some eloquent language that brings it all together as one, ending with that poetic line, one God and parent of us all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Those two psalms for today, 133 and 134, are often paired together in worship, partly because they are both short, but also because they wrap up a section of the psalms known as the Psalms of Ascent, which were intended to celebrate the journey of pilgrims to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Psalm 133 begins with these words, How very good and pleasant it is when kindred, or the NIV you read, the people of God live together in unity. And Psalm 134 ends with asking for the blessing of God, the maker of heaven and earth. So it begins with unity between people and ends with unity within the totality of God's creation. The psalmist compares unity among people, especially people who represent some diversity, as being lovely, as lovely as precious oil on the head, running down in this imagery of on the beard of Aaron and onto his robes. All of this, of course, images of abundance and blessing. In the ancient Near East, not only were kings and priests anointed with oil, but hosts would pour sweet-smelling oil on the head of their guests as a symbol of generosity and welcome. I don't encourage you to try it, but we have other ways of showing <laughs> generosity in our culture, but that's the symbol that it was. And then the next image continues the theme of liquid pouring down, but this time it's water. It's the dew of Mount Hermon flowing down to Mount Zion. As you can imagine, ancient Palestine was a dry climate and any water was precious. And dew was often the only moisture that preserved the crops late in the season. Mount Hermon was up north near Lebanon and Syria, and it was the headwaters of the river Jordan. Beautiful imagery of a mountain shared with enemies that provided the life-giving water for the people on the north side of the mountain as well as on the south side. The Psalms offers these lofty poetic images, and then Ephesians gets more specific and more direct. You know, when you read between the lines, there must have been some conflict going on at the church in Ephesus because there's much advice on unity, its importance, and how to attain it. First, there is their appeal, the appeal to their sense of calling. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you were called. It's a beautiful admonition that we should all heed. We've just seen the transition of the crown from Queen Elizabeth II to King Charles III, and Ian and Anne were there for uh, much of the, uh, what's the word? Not celebration, <laughs> the, the, the services in honor of the Queen. You know, for uh, Charles, it would have been helpful when he was young to have been reminded of this phrase from Ephesians, to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You know, in recent years, he's earned back a lot of respect, but there were years when his behavior and the behavior of several of the royal family members was not worthy of their calling. We like what we see so far in William and Kate, but we'll see. The Queen is going to be a tough act to follow because she certainly lived that motto, live a life worthy of the calling to which you were called. And you may be thinking, oh, well, that's royalty. You know, I'm just a commoner. We don't use that language here in America, but you know what I mean. Uh, but in God's family, we are all royalty. Paul says in Romans that we are all joint heirs with Christ. So we all should remember that these words apply to us. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you were called. Then Ephesians offers the how-to of unity. Don't you love how easy it is to find instructions for almost anything these days? You can Google uh, how to and then it starts and away you go, how to get stain out of a carpet or whatever. And YouTube, you just type in how to and you get videos on everything from fixing a leaky faucet to changing the brakes on your car. 
Well, there was no internet back then, of course, so Ephesians had to provide this how-to list in a letter. And this is how to obtain unity, especially where there is conflict. This is the how-to list. With all humility, gentleness, and patience, bear with one another in love. Easier said than done, but clearly the main ingredients of unity. And finally, there is a list of ones that emphasizes unity. Ephesians says there is one body, one spirit, and one hope, and we are united by one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And then those beautiful words to wrap it all up, one God, parent of us all, who is above all, through all, and in all. So what does all this mean on World Communion Sunday? How can we live a life worthy of our calling? How can we model the kind of unity that is like oil flowing down the beard of Aaron? What's our how-to video? What are our instructions? Well, like our scriptures for today taught us, let's think in both the big picture and in specific actions. The big picture is that we are all one family, not just Christians or us New Yorkers or Americans, we are one human family. Global warming is as much a challenge to Bangladesh as it is to Florida. And so one way we honor our calling is to see other human beings as kindred in the family of God. The migrants at the border, the people of the other political party, the Russian soldier committing atrocities. We are all part of the family of God. And the sooner we all recognize that oneness, the sooner we will address the climate crisis and end wars and reduce the need for migration. And then, as Ephesians reminds us, it starts at home. It starts with the way we treat one another, first in our home, then in our church and community, and so on. It starts with showing humility, gentleness, and patience with one another, and once again, it starts at home with those closest to you. And sometimes those are the ones we find it hardest to love in that way, isn't it? So that is why we will spend the rest of this month focusing on those relationships within family. It's no accident that this day of unity is a day of communion. This table is the ultimate symbol of unity within diversity. It is the table where our Lord demonstrated that he had lived a life worthy of the calling. In this symbol of hospitality and inclusion, we are united as one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one table, one bread, one cup, one host, one guest, one worldwide human family. Come to this table of oneness. Come share this sacred meal with your family the family of God. Amen. Good to be together and as the family, and the family of God in this place, the PCMK family on this World Communion Sunday and throughout the month of October there will be lots of events and themes in worship and after worship. Especially uh, pay attention to an adult ed opportunity on the 23rd and Elizabeth and I will do a little sharing some of our experience as parents, sharing with all the parents of our church. So if you want to come and join us for some discussion on the 23rd after worship and then the sign up for the walk to end all hunger and then at the end of the month good old trunk or treat can't have October without that, right? Well, it's great to be part of such a wonderful church family. And it's been a good, be, let's go and share the love we have for one another with those all around us, thinking that ever, ever widening that circle to include all of God's children. And now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all God's people said.